Overthinkers, what unlikely scenario came true that you were totally prepared for? When my wife and I were getting married and looking for a place for a ceremony, we found this beautiful but quite remote garden. We were signing the contract for the event and I kept thinking that it was quite remote, so I asked, how much time does it take for the ambulance to get here? I became the laughing stock of both families. My then future mother-in-law who was present at the meeting literally fell down from the chair laughing. The wedding organizer remembered it for weeks, telling everyone we met about it. My dad ended every sentence with, but maybe you need an ambulance for that. My wife was making siren noises when I was saying something we disagreed on. At every family dinner, all the aunts and uncles were checking if the ambulance was present. You name it, the entire package. Still, I couldn't get rid of this weird feeling. It would have taken over an hour for the ambulance to get to the garden. After a few weeks, I ended up paying a private ambulance to be present at the wedding. Fast forward to the ceremony as my wife literally walks down the aisle at the back of the garden I see two paramedics running with a stretcher and my dad squeezing my hand whispering, that's not of your goddamn business, let them take care of it. What happened was that one of our older guests had a heart attack and almost died at the ceremony, was saved by the private ambulance. Ever since then, when my wife tells me that I'm overthinking, I just make the siren noise. Wow, are wedding heart attacks a thing? My grandfather-in-law had a cardiac event at my wedding. He lives in the middle of nowhere, Alaska, but was in a city with multiple world-class hospitals for the wedding. I don't like to think what would have happened if we hadn't been in town for our ceremony. Honestly, as someone who lives in a rural area where plenty of out-of-towners book destination weddings here or come here to go camping, get away for a while, etc., I wish more people would consider how long help would take to arrive if they needed it. So good on you for considering your guests' well-being and saving a life by having an ambulance standing by during your event. Had an ambulance show up at my wedding as well. Lucky for me, I had a table of nurses who worked in a level 1 trauma center, so when my mom and her friends said, we got this, it's fine, I just went back to dancing. They thought my practically blind diabetic aunt was having some kind of diabetic emergency. I don't know, I'm not a diabetic. Turns out she was just drunk off of her ass. I mean, I've gotta ask, did you know how unbelievably rude your wife and your families were? I mean, your wife should be weeping at your feet begging for your forgiveness and being respectful and listening to you for the rest of her life. Was it eye-opening that they could be so barbarically rude? Nobody I want to spend even a second with, let alone a lifetime. That would be a deal breaker for me. Story two. I was once driving on the highway behind a car with a couple of kayaks strapped to the roof. My anxious brain kept saying, what if they fall off the car, final destination style? I tried to convince myself that it was an irrational fear, but the anxiety got the better of me and I decided to change lanes and make some distance. About 30 seconds later, cue kayaks. They both slip off the roof and go rolling around on the highway. Luckily, no one was hurt, but man, did that not help my anxiety at all. And to address some comments, one, I figured I was overthinking, since I don't know anyone else who gets nervous or avoids driving behind cars with loads, but I see now that maybe my behavior wasn't so weird. Two, apparently a lot of you have seen falling kayaks on the highway. I don't think this is the same exact incident as any of the ones you guys have described. From comments about how to properly tie down a kayak, I think these were not properly secured. I don't think that they were tied to the bumpers. I definitely do the final destination worries thing too. Usually a big truck piled with giant logs or something, you wonder if some part of you unconsciously registered that the kayaks had been shifting in some way. I've read that your body can pick up subtle signs of impending doom in various ways that can make you afraid, even if you're not sure why. I also have anxiety so I can relate, but you probably legitimately subconsciously saw some clues that it wasn't secure. Your subconscious mind couldn't articulate the danger beyond fear of that exact situation. But it was enough to prompt your conscious mind to act, if only to end the anxiety in the moment. Yep, was driving down the highway and spotted a family moving their stuff in an open trailer. Sat there and thought, that mattress isn't tied down, it's going to take off like a sail. Started getting over and speeding up to get ahead of it, and sure enough, took off like a sail. Right onto the highway. Happened soon enough after I spotted them, 
that I wasn't out of danger yet, but because I was watching for it and had started to move out of harm's way, I was able to safely swerve out of its path. When I was a handyman, my biggest fear was my ladders falling off of my roof racks and into the traffic behind me. I'd tie extra straps and double and triple check that the ladders wouldn't move. Then, after getting up some speed, especially on highways, I'd pull over and check them again. This is all because when I was a kid, this happened to one of my friend's moms, and she ended up in a wheelchair. I couldn't stand seeing other tradies tie their stuff down with only two friction straps. I was driving north from Miami, and as you do, going with the flow of traffic, which was about 90 miles per hour at the time, a freaking Prius with a large old recliner was strapped, badly, without any consideration to rational methods of strapping, to the back of the freaking car and passed me in the next lane over. My brain started doing its thing, and if it hadn't, I'd have been wholly unprepared for when the freaking recliner detached and veered across a few lanes of traffic followed shortly thereafter by the idiot driving the freaking Prius to veer across all the lanes of traffic and get off at the next exit. All of which I was able to avoid with maybe a foot of clearance at best. Always be sober and attentive on the road, guys. Freaking pay attention. If you can't, don't get behind the wheel. I've seen way too many instances of this stuff happen on the highway and it doesn't usually end well for anyone. Driving a car is pretty dangerous and wild when you think about it. You're in a multi-ton metal and composite machine going 80 miles per hour within about one foot between complete strangers doing the same thing, who may or may not be sober and may very well be distracted. When driving, always give yourself as much space as possible and risk mitigation whenever possible. Plenty can go wrong fast and riding someone's bumper only gets you deader quicker. Story 3. Injuring my dominant hand. As a kid, I had an irrational fear of having it chopped off. I spent all of grade 6 teaching myself to write and do things with my left hand. I made a conscious effort to remain as ambidextrous as possible. As an adult, I broke a few fingers on my dominant hand, but it wasn't a big issue because I could do most things equally with my left hand. Anticlimactic, but it was useful. Brained my right dominant hand wrist on holiday in Hawaii. Alcohol plus stairs. Slowly trained my left hand to use a computer mouse at work on return from holiday and just never stopped. Still right mouse at home though, my neck and shoulders appreciate the balanced workload. I broke my middle, ring, and little finger on my dominant right hand last summer, and am having to slowly teach myself to use my left hand. I can no longer use a fine grip with my right hand. Of course, there are worse things that can happen to a person, but it's been pretty significant. My job requires a lot of typing, and that's now a complete nightmare. I'm lucky I live between the UK and Australia because that means I can still drive a manual car. I wouldn't be able to operate the gear stick with my dominant hand anymore, but I can just about curl it around the steering wheel. Wish I had had your preemptive knowledge. This hits home to me so much. I just crushed off a third of my index finger on my dominant right hand in January in a work accident and it's crazy how much it has changed my life. Things happen in an instant and I'm still dealing with the process and not sure how things will play out, but that's a legitimate fear I never thought about until it happens. Ditto, except I never really had a fear. I am naturally ambidextrous, so I played that up whenever possible, so an injury would not slow me down. The day came when it happened. I hyperflexed my two finger tendons in a fall. Doc said, it might have been easier on me if I'd just broken them. I didn't disagree, but I didn't have to take time off of work for it, as I'm a cashier. I used to worry about becoming blind, so I learned to navigate most areas with my eyes closed. To this day, I can walk my house with my eyes closed and not run into furniture even with it shuffling around during everyday use. I don't know if that ability is unique, but I think the practice as a kid has helped me ensure that I can fairly accurately remember exactly where things are. Same, nothing happened to me but having two arms you could depend on to do a multitude of tasks instead of having one that can and another one that's basically, eh, it can carry slash hold things steady, I guess, is hella useful. It's a lot of small things, like when you close the door and hang up the keys. I can use both hands. I don't need to close the door first and then hang up my keys. 
Or when you sit down and it's cramped and awkward to write using your dominant hand, you just shift a little and write using your other hand. Similarly, tasks that you usually kind of fumble through using your non-dominant hand, e.g. typing on your phone while eating, you can control a lot more precisely. Try it sometime. When you're doing your chores, see what your dominant arm or hand does versus what the other does. It's shocking how much relegated to merely holding stuff steady the other arm does instead of being able to function as a somewhat co-equal manipulator. Story 4 in college, on occasion, upperclassmen would randomly steal the underclassmen towels from the shower stalls and then lock their room doors so they had to go to the RA bare naked. I had the idea to stash a towel in the drop ceiling tiles for just that event. Maybe a week later I became the victim of a towel snatching. However, the upperclassmen were very unhappy to see me strut out with a nice clean towel from my ceiling stash. Something similar happened to me at my sorority house but I just showered for a really long time until they got tired of waiting. I sang and sang and sang. They were my friends and they knew I didn't mind being naked. The ceiling stash is genuinely an underappreciated spot. You wouldn't believe how many times we used it in school. As an adult, I've used it to buy and sell small amounts of bud at my slash their work more than once. It was a godsend in the dorms as well, although many no longer had dropped ceilings. I went to an all-boys boarding school. It teaches you to prepare for stuff like this. College was a breeze in comparison. Namely, never have your stuff out of reach. Relevant example, when bathing, you can wrap your towel around the shower head slash clean a bit of pipe instead of leaving it hanging on the door. Carried all my bathing supplies in a little pail that I could put down at my feet. Didn't even need to be pranked to learn this, to be honest, as I was just naturally a paranoid kid. Also a bit of a ne'er-does-well myself, too, so I anticipated these shenanigans. Story 5 I always carried an extra juice box slash snacks and an extra set of clothes during high school because I was always worried that one of the kids in my school with diabetes might get low and need some sugar for the juice box and snacks. And I might get dirty or my clothes would get ruined, the extra clothes. Well, one day, the kid in my class with diabetes did need the sugar. As luck would have it, a few days later, a girl in my class was having a really bad wardrobe malfunction and couldn't wait for a new shirt. So my XXL t-shirt acted as both a shirt slash dress for her. I carry bird seeds around with me to feed the ducks on campus because I worry about how much rice and naan the students are feeding them. One day I'm on the way onto campus and I see a lady with her toddler who is fascinated with a bird, but it keeps hopping away every time the baby toddles forward. So I stop and tell the mom that I have bird seed in my pocket if her kid wants to feed the bird. It wasn't until later that I realized that from her perspective, she was in the park with her kid when a stranger approached her and announced, I have bird seed in my pocket. Okay, so this is true for me with my kids. My trunk has been packed since they were very little with various supplies that we might need. Extra clothes, wipes, snacks, water slash towels, first aid, frisbees, bouncy balls for a stuck or bored time, etc. It's just always ready to go and has evolved to include and not include various things as they've gotten older. I may look like a crazy type A mom to some people, but I cannot tell you the number of times I've been so happy to have something I really needed back there. I always carry at least plasters in my bag, and I've been teased for it a little, but they've come in useful more than once. One notable time being when my partner and I went to visit his mom, and his brother was there doing an at-home STI test. I agreed to help him with the finger pricking to get blood bit, and when it took several fingers to get enough, oops, patched him up with my plasters, and he was especially pleased because they were really cool tattoo design ones. It was a really lovely bonding experience and such a treasured memory. He took his own life a few months ago after that, and I'll never be able to get to know him better or be able to tease him about how much he squeaked when I kept sticking him with needles. I thought he'd be a part of the whole rest of my life, and he still will of course, but instead it'll just be the hole he left. My mom was the same. When I, the first, original, and best, was born, she read some advice to have a change of clothes, blanket, and easy-to-use canned food you keep in the car for the kid. Apart from the usual bag you pack, just in case. Mom did so, religiously changing it out as we grew. 
It was a source of amusement for my dad, and any family members she were militant on keeping it stocked. Fast forward eight years, with two younger brothers, also with emergency supplies kept in the car, and we were driving out to see family for Christmas. Dad was working away and would fly over a few days later. We were between towns on a rural stretch with little traffic and the car started billowing smoke from the front. After a panicked evac with the car off, it clears and mum is game to approach and check it out. The radiator hose has split and spit steam. No bueno. It was cold in the early evening and we were to get dinner on the ferry and the next run of cars would be in an hour. All before mobile phones were common. But guess which kids had a warm jumper, blanket, and a hot can of spaghetti heated over a hexamine stove? Within a month, every one of her friends had the same kit in their cars too. Story 6. I carry scissors in my glove compartment. They came in handy when a kid tightened a skinny zip tie around my nine-year-old's finger at a park, completely cut off the circulation. Also, the other kid's mom was a nurse, so that was helpful too carry scissors and a nurse at all times. My mom has scissors in the car. One day she has most of the younger grandkids, toddler to grade school age, in the car and my nephew is in the third row sitting in the back. They are going through a drive through and while my mom is ordering food, somehow this nephew got the seat belt wrapped around his neck and it locks, keeps tightening. My mom is trying to get out of the car in the drive. It's one of those where you are stuck in the queue once you get in line, there's no exit. Trying to get to him in the third row and the seat belt has tightened to the point that they can't unwrap it. So she has one of the other kids get her scissors from the glove compartment. Just cut the witch right off. Aside from some tears, my nephew is okay. Turns out that there have been several other incidents with the seatbelts in her style of car malfunctioning, and the dealership fixed it for free. She did threaten to be loud about the fact that her car tried to kill her grandson, but hey, they still fixed it. I'm a hairstylist, and I'm pretty handy and mechanically inclined. I can say for a fact that having an old pair of shears and or a razor knife in your car is one of the smartest things you could possibly keep. Also, I'm from New England, and as such, we were always taught to keep an emergency pack, aka a freaking stuck kit, in my trunk and a couple of blankets and slash or some winter jackets and hats and gloves, some basic hand tools, a flashlight, kitty litter for getting stuck in snow, maybe a portable shovel, lighter, and just some other basic things, such as maybe a battery pack phone charger and a couple of cans of ravioli or beefaroni, etc., with the pop top, some plastic forks are good to have too. People underestimate how screwed you could really be if you get stuck or break down in the middle of winter with no help around and no heat. A vehicle that won't run can't crank the heat. Yes, I've been stranded before and have had to use my freaking stuck kit. It took six hours in less than 10 degree weather before anybody drove by. I likely would have frozen to death if I hadn't prepared. My grandfather on my mom's side was a big rig driver for 40 years. He's the one who taught me about the freaking stuck stash and I'll never go anywhere without at least blankets and some basic supplies in my vehicles. I'd never let my significant other travel without hers either. She's capable of changing a tire, but I'm sure that many other spouses aren't quite as handy and stuff happens, man. You gotta be prepared. It's that simple. Story 7. I carry some of just about everything in my purse. We were at a beach during the off season and a kid was wiped out. I had everything needed to clean, bandage him up. I carried that stuff, renewing when it got old, for almost 20 years before actually needing it. I have a similar experience. I have just about everything you could possibly need to survive in the car if it breaks down or something else happens. I was driving and an old couple was crossing a driveway headed home after a nice lunch out. The lady biffed it on the curb. She had ripped quite a bit of her skin and was bleeding all over the place. I saw them, pulled my car over, and was able to hop out, clean her up, and bandage everything up. It felt really good to be prepared and help the frantic old couple. Ah yes, purses. Mine has six lipsticks, a pack of powdered soup, a first aid kit, 36 tampons, eight pads, because who knows, I guess, two vape coils for a vape I don't even have, 12 business cards, an expired debit card and license, and a house key to a house I moved out of four years ago. I wonder which of that will actually come in handy. Probably the soup. 
One of my coworkers does the same thing. One day I needed a spoon to eat some yogurt in the break room and he started digging through his many jacket pockets and found a bundle of plastic spoons for me to use. He didn't even need them for his own lunch. He just always carried around everything he might conceivably need. I traveled to South America in college, and before I left, I asked my doctor for several courses of antibiotics to take with me just in case. I also bought a slew of OTC meds, everything from Advil to Imodium. Everyone thought I was being dramatic until we were stuck for 12 hours by the river in the rainforest, and several of my classmates came down with awful diarrhea from some foreign to us illness or another. Then I was the hero with the antibiotics and anti-diarrheals, lol. I also had extra towels, and multiple people had neglected to bring one, assuming there would be some at the hostel, I guess. So yes, my anxiety, OCD, and overthinking sometimes come in handy. I posted my whole story here too, but first aid kits are extremely vital. For years, I kept a neck immobilizer, scissors to cut clothes, and gloves in the first aid kit in my car. Well, one day, a man got run over by a truck in front of me, so I was able to provide some basic care and get him ready to be simply flipped onto the blackboard. He was face down by the time EMS arrived on scene. The police officer taking my statement didn't know quite what to make of it, and the fire department took my second spare collar, which the officer was nice enough to get replaced, and got two new ones for me, so my stash is still there. Story 8. So maybe not quite this, but my little sister. Through a long series of events, my parents, who were not foster parents and not looking to adopt, ended up taking care of an infant, who was not at all related to us, whose mother had just died. It was only supposed to be for a few weeks until she could be moved to a more permanent placement. As soon as I found out that my parents had agreed to help watch her temporarily, I knew where this is going and I had all the initial adoption application paperwork printed out before she ever got to our house. Needless to say, my parents were pretty surprised the day they said that they were thinking of adopting her, and I handed them a folder of forms and my handwritten notes on how the process worked. For the record, she has legally been my little sister for seven years now. So, weirdly, your parents' situation is actually my biggest fear. I have an irrational fear of finding children and then them becoming my responsibility. I know that's not how a situation would occur if I found a missing kid or anything like that. It's to the point where if I hear a kid crying, looking for their parents in a store, my heart races, my hands get clammy, and I have to run out of the store. Oddly, I did stop and double check there wasn't a baby in a stroller that was just left on the outside of a forest. Scared me to hell to check, but I had to make sure. Though now knowing your parents' story, it makes me feel like my fear is a tiny bit more realistic. Props to your parents and you for being so accepting and prepared. Just gave me chills reading my fear becoming true in a weird way. Story 9. Went through a stage as a teenager where I thought I was psychic. I know, I know, stupid. A friend asked me jokingly to make a prediction. I told him to get a flashlight because tomorrow would be dark. I grabbed one myself when I got home and put it in my purse. No idea why, just did it. The next day, the eastern seaboard blackouts happened. He still asks for predictions to this day. This happened to me. When I was a kid, I used to think I was psychic. I'd say something or make up a scenario in my head and it would happen. I still believe I can bring things into existence. Sounds so stupid. I do the same thing with scratch cards. I feel like I have a weird sense of winning things. I don't buy them. But if someone buys some and offers me one, I get a feeling that one will win. My family thinks it's spooky. I only ever scratch cards that I feel I'll win, and I always win them. I was visiting my partner a few years ago, and he ended up having to travel overseas for work during my visit. It was going to be at least a week of him being gone, and I started missing him before he even left. The second day into his trip, I was lonely and my anxiety started to rise. On our video call after he was off work that day, I was saying how much I missed him and wanted him to come home. He said he may have to stay longer than expected. I said I wish the plant would catch fire and you'd get to come home tomorrow. The next morning he called me. You freaking sorceress. You'll never guess what happened. There was a fire at the plant and they have to close down for repairs, so I'll be coming home on the next flight out. 
I'm not saying that it's possible that I'm a witch, but I am saying this isn't the first time I spoke things into existence. My cousin keeps asking me what's going to happen with big events because I predicted the pandemic. I started seeing the videos of Wuhan on Twitter in late November slash December. The narrative was that it was under control and we'd be fine, but I got super paranoid and told my roommates, cousin and brother, that we needed supplies. They kept calling me nuts and saying nothing was going to happen. I bought a bunch of canned foods, meat to freeze, rice and pasta, bottled water, etc. Specifically, I bought like 200 packs of toilet paper from a commercial supplier online, lol. Then it hit the US and everything shut down. I never thought it would be like contagion level crazy, but luckily it didn't get as bad as I thought. Instead, it was just the three of us eating good food, playing Call of Duty until 4 a.m. every night, and being able to wipe our ass. That reminds me of a few years ago when I was at work. I work at an animal shelter and we got a call about a house fire and there were a bunch of birds in an aviary in the front yard. We went there and managed to retrieve about 40 birds. About 20 had sadly died. The next day I came in to start my shift and I saw more cages with another 30 birds with the original 40. I asked my boss about them and she told me that there were more birds that survived by hiding under the dead birds. I asked her how she found out and she told me she had a dream the previous night that more birds survived so she felt she needed to go back to double check the aviary for more birds. Story 10. I'm an amateur clarinetist. I've played in the local orchestra and the like. My son was in the high school band, also played clarinet. Prior to a football game at the warm-up area, he called me as I was about to head to the game, saying that someone in his section had a problem with their instrument. So did I have a loner? Now, the thing about being a clarinet player is that everyone you know calls you every time they see a cheap plastic clarinet for sale at a garage sale, or the like. So over the years, especially when my son was in junior and senior high, when I saw one of these for 50 to 100 bucks, I grabbed it. Didn't happen every day, but at the peak of my collection, I had a couple of beater plastic clarinets, in addition to pretty good wooden ones that my son played. And Lord knows I wouldn't trust anyone with my good clarinets in B, B, and A I used in the orchestra. So I grabbed both of these plastic jobs, which actually played okay, and brought them. I pulled the one I thought was the better of the two out of the car and gave it to my son's friend. Meanwhile, he says, Hey, another person ran into a problem, and I got the second clarinet out of my car. How many clarinets do you have? was my son's question. It was a proud moment. I noticed a trend amongst some musicians to just slowly accumulate instruments. I had a friend with a couple of acoustic guitars, a couple of electric guitars, a pretty nice bass, a frankly unsettling number of banjos and ukuleles, and by far the largest gong I've ever personally seen. When I was a kid, my grandpa took me fishing sometimes. He wanted me to be the grandson he always wanted, so he tried to make me into a fisherman. It didn't take. He gave me a tackle box with a bunch of lures and a box of crickets that I guess you're supposed to use for bait. I just kept the tackle box, even though I never really enjoyed fishing. Nine years later, all my friends are hanging out at my house, getting baked out of our skulls. My buddy's girlfriend comes over and she's freaking out about some report that she has to do by the next day, and she was really harshing the mellow. I asked her what the report was about, and she said, bugs. I need some bugs, so unless you know where I can get some bugs, I'm screwed. So I said, oh, all right. I went to the garage and looked into my tackle box and then brought back a plastic canister of crickets. She said, why the hell do you have a canister of bugs? All of a sudden, I'm the weirdo with the bugs. Story 11. This was at nine years old. We had driven home and seen the beginning wisps of smoke from the California Cedar Fire in 2003. Naturally, I assumed the worst, packed all of my clothes, and spent about an hour making a travel cage for my guinea pigs. I tied their water bottle to the side so that they could drink, and packed up their food and their favorite furniture just in case. I then spent the next few hours monitoring the fire on the news and out in the distance from our window, periodically asking my parents if we needed to evacuate. At some point in the night, the fire sped up like crazy and was literally on the hillside across the street. 
I went into my parents' room and said, the fire is across the street. Are you sure we shouldn't evacuate? At this point, we all went crazy grabbing important documents and supplies. As we were about to lock the doors and drive, I realized I forgot my guinea pigs. My parents told me it was too late and I didn't have time to grab them. But when I cried and explained that I had packed up, I was able to grab them and go. The house ended up okay thanks to a neighbor putting out embers before they took it. But we were gone long enough, my pigs wouldn't have made it. TLDR helped save my family and pets from a fire because I was an anxious child. My husband and I made a plan in case of an emergency with getting our cats. One morning about 7 a.m. the fire alarm goes off, wakes us up and the kitties take off running because of the noise. We jumped up, got dressed, and grabbed our go bags. Our plan was to shut our bedroom doors to catch the cats in the living room. Nowhere for them to run under. We easily picked them up and put them in the carrier. We were out the door in 15 minutes or less. Turns out it was just a water sprinkler busted, but we had everything we needed. Also made us feel better. If anything actually happened. Good on you for being prepared. Last year my mom called to tell me there was a wildfire near San Jose, where my grandma and auntie live. But that it was nowhere near town, so don't worry. Except my grandma lives on the outskirts of town. I looked at a map and realized the only thing between her house and the fire was a bunch of dry grassland and chaparral. Grandma is 90 and frail, so evacuating would be a slow and difficult process for her. I called my aunt around noon and told her she needed to start packing up just in case. Everyone in the family thought I was just being ridiculous, but I made her promise. Tracked the fire all day and saw it slowly moving towards her house. At 8 p.m., my aunt called and said since they hadn't been told to evacuate yet, she was planning to go to bed early and then get up before dawn to drive to my place with grandma because it's a long drive and she was worried about being tired on the road. I told her, do not go to bed. That fire could move quicker than you think. You guys need to leave now. She did. Around midnight, when she would have been asleep, an evacuation order was announced for their neighborhood, and the fire came very close to many of the buildings. Thankfully, she'd listened to me, so she, Grandma, my 10-year-old cousin, and their cat were all well out of the way by then. Thanks for watching until the end. If you have a similar story to these that you would like to share with us, please leave it in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please leave us a like and subscribe. For more videos like this one right now, please stop by our channel. Thanks again and see you next time.